to welcome you all here today um, for a really exciting show. This is a show brought to you by NABIS and IBIA, and it comes from the Brain Injury Professional Magazine, which was on women versus brain injury. And what I've been doing for the last 10 weeks is interviewing uh, people that I believe are really creating the narrative for the story of women versus brain injury. And today I have a very exciting guest, Dr. Willie Stewart, and I have had the privilege of twice going up to Glasgow to his laboratory and actually seeing the brain bank and getting to know him. So uh, welcome, Dr. Stewart. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. It's great to have you. Um, so one of the things that I do to the guests, this sounds like torture, but no, I like- you're, you're, it's, a, it's a good start. Go, go, <laughs> what, what are you gonna do to me? I, what I wanna do the benefit is- benefit of being a Zoom meeting, you can't actually do anything to me. You can ask me questions, but I'm safe. Well, we'll see. We'll see how safe you are. <laughs> um, how, as a child, how did you relate to science and what got you to where you are today? Because I think so many students assume that, um, you know, they look at the top researchers in the world and they feel like that goal is unattainable. Can you just talk a little bit about your journey to become the world-renowned uh, brain <laughs> person that you are? So uh, that's, a, that's, that, that's a really tough question. Um, so I guess, uh, when, when, when I was at, when I was at school, let's, let's start with school. Should we go back to school? Was that, is yes. that too far back? Or should we want to Love come? That. No, okay, do that. let's start school. So when I was at school, um, in high school, um, I was really, uh, I was really, I was the guy that, that you know, I really liked the science side of things. Um, and, uh, I studied, uh, biology, chemistry, physics, maths, English, can't remember what else, French, something like that, uh, as my, as my kind of, uh, subject. And, and I really, I was really fascinated by the kind of interplay between physics, biology, chemistry, you know, how, how these science technology uh, subjects all kind of bled into each other and, and tried to kind of bring them together. And then that kind of drove me into studying medicine and in studying medicine. So in the UK, it's, it, there's a, it's a, an undergraduate degree medicine and the first two years were what we call pre-clinical sciences. So that's physiology, anatomy, um, biochemistry, subjects like that. And at the end of the first year in physiology, um, the, there was a professor, Ian Boyd, who started telling us the story about something called an action potential, which is the way that nerves uh, communicate. So how the electrical signal passes down a nerve fiber from one side to the other. And this was physics and chemistry and biology, all wrapped up in the maths, all wrapped up in one story. And uh, this lecture, you know, the hour long lecture right at the end of physiology in first year. And he, uh, the, uh, he, he, he got to a point where he was just about to tell us how all this, all this activity transmitted into electrical signal down the fiber. And just before he got to that point, he said, now we'll pause there and we'll come back next year and I'll tell you the rest of the story. And I was like, what? No, come on. This is the most exciting thing we've heard all along. And, uh, it's a sad story, actually, because, you know, next year I kind of forced my way down to the front of the lecture theatre, you know, which is where, you know, uh, the cool guys didn't go. And I wasn't a cool guy, but I was in mid, mid lecture theatre. But I forced my way down to the front of the lecture theatre to hear the end of the story from Professor Boyd. And sadly, Professor Boyd didn't come back. He, he'd passed away over summer. Um, yeah. And I, I said, this is this is tragic. This guy had so much to tell, so much to give. And he, and he never he never got to finish the story. But that over that summer and I'd spent. I, I was reading, um, you know, popular science on uh, on neuroscience. I was reading uh, Oliver Sacks and Harold Klawans and all these things because I thought, this brain is amazing. You know, this is you know, how does this work? And I guess that hooked me. And so, all through my undergraduate medical career, postgraduate medical career, postgraduate training, I've tried to kind of weave, you know, into other subjects and other, you know, pathways in life to find what else could interest me. But I always kept oscillating back towards neuroscience uh, and I found I did uh, clinical medicine for a while but found that um, I was more fascinated in trying to understand how things worked and, and went wrong than necessarily the patient interaction treatment side of it so that, that drew me to labs and labs drew me to um, neuropathology and uh, there the big subject in our neuropathology center in Glasgow is brain injury you know that's 
Glasgow Coma Scale was invented in Glasgow for good reason. You know, we, we like to uh, go out and uh, beat each other up on a Friday night. So we had a lot of brain injury to work with. And uh, and so I, I entered that research environment and and was hooked really from, from day one. So there you go. That's a quick rundown. School That's to... Awesome yeah. story. And then when I went to, your, to the brain bank, um, you showed me uh, a, a history of brains that's rather unique for uh, the the fact that uh, you inherited a collection. True. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think I think you know some people think that they, the this whole interest in um, outcomes from brain injury. So you know what what happens after somebody gets a brain injury? What happens years, decades after a brain injury? Pe people think this is a a modern phenomenon that we've only just started, you know, talking about it in the last decade or two, you know, since, you know, beginning of 2000. Since Twitter was around. <laughs> since, well, yeah, uh, probably about that. Yeah, we're slightly further back, but, but, but within the last 10 or 20 years. But the reality is there was a, there was a meeting, believe it or not, in uh, NIH in 1969. And it's called, it was called something like the late effects of brain injury. And it was then you know, experts in brain injury around the world got together to figure out, you know, what happens years down the line after brain injury. So, you know, we're talking 50, I don't know, 52 years ago, this was first discussed or discussed in a big forum like that. And uh, there was uh, one of the neurosurgical colleagues from Glasgow, who was part of the leadership of that meeting, uh, 1969, and he came back and said to one of my predecessors, listen, Nobody seems to know what's happening years after brain injury, but, but things are happening. So let's start uh, looking at specimens of people who've sustained brain injury and understanding what the biology and pathology is. Let's start a brain bank. Let's see if we can gather material to look at it in a research capacity in a really sensible way. And so that started in the early 70s and continues right up to now. So, so we've got a 50 year experience of uh, research in the pathology of uh, brain injury. And I think there's something like two, over 2,000, 2,500 uh, patients worth of material in our archive, which is, which is unique. There's nothing like it in the world. And it allows, if you look at the pathology of brain injury, virtually everything that's written about the pathology of human brain injury has a, you know, an origin, a genesis in our archive, because that's the place to study it. Yeah, this is my typical party trick. How many brains of females did you inherit in that collection? Uh, it's something like around about five to six hundred. Um, you know, we, we actually have quite a few um, because the, these were not, you know, this is before the day that we thought sport was an important thing. Um, this was in the day where uh, people with brain injury exposure, you know, the kind of things we were looking at were uh, road traffic accidents. Train uh, accidents. Uh, yeah, um, assaults, falls. So, you know, and, and, and the, these, these, these happen to everybody. There's a slight difference, actually, that we, we looked at male versus female um, brain injury in terms of exposures, and the slight difference is more assaults in men, would you believe, Friday night assaults, more road traffic accidents than women in our archive. Um, but we do have, we do have a quite a number of, of women. Women's sport, which is obviously, you know, sport has become the big topic in uh, brain injury in the last couple of decades. Women's sport, we have, we have very few. I think that we count them, you know, on the, on the fingers of one finger. Um, we have very few. Um, we joined together um, in December of 2019 and did a UK Pink Brain Pledge. Um, we were on the BBC Scotland and Scotland, uh, uh, BBC the UK, and gosh, got in e almost every newspaper. Um, because you had connections to women who were um, historical figures in women's sport. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the, the outreach that you made and the response back from that campaign you did it in December? Yes. So, so, I mean, they, they, you know, we, we've known each other for a long time and, and had similar conversations about how do, how do we engage better with uh, women's sport women in general with brain injury because because it's, it's a neglected research field in many ways and i did probably a couple of years ago i did a, a there's, there's a radio program in the uk called women's hour uh, which is uh, a mid-morning radio show on on one of the bbc radio channels and it has a incredibly large um uh, audience 
and it it was it was a story about uh, concussion in in women's sport, and uh, they they invited me if I if I could go along and talk about concussion and the difference between male and female you know, brains in terms of injury, and did that and and it was um, I, I mean I've done a bunch of media stuff and a bunch of conversations, and. Uh, and, and, you know, you occasionally get people afterwards will, will get in touch and say, that was fascinating. Could you tell me more? I, even now, two years down the line, I'm still being contacted by people who were listening into that or have listened to it on, on playback and heard the story. Now, what that did was it engaged with people, which, you know, we, we, were, we could never find a good way of engaging with that, with this population, but we've, we now managed to engage with this population. So from that, we were contacted by um, ex-athletes, international athletes in football, in hockey, who have stories of brain injury and post-concussive symptoms or uh, dementia um, and wanted to uh, participate in what we were doing. Now, we had a brain donation program, but as you and I discussed, what we really hadn't done was, was, was kind of raise awareness of that with uh, the women who might want to engage in research. So when you and I had the opportunity to try and uh, bring that to the forefront, um, it was incredibly successful. Uh, and we have now, um, I think since we launched it, COVID got in the way, but since we launched it uh, around about uh, 18 months, it's not quite 18 months, is it? We, we have had quite a number of, of women register to uh, donate brains, also uh, contact us interested in participating in research and also and, and as we encourage, just reach out and ask us questions because um, one thing we can try and do is answer people's questions even if we can't engage in research directly. Um, it was fabulous. And to meet the, uh, the women that I met and the same, the same response, I was just was speaking this morning, the, I got re reached out, the editor of um, Neuro Times, a UK science magazine said the articles that they did on female brain injury were some of the most popular the last two years across all their science articles. Um, and so they want to reach out and update that. Um, but we really we got press everywhere. Um, one of the connections I know that you and I want to make um, is connecting women to the research, but also within the context of sport, which pulls people in to then flip it on its head and talk about domestic violence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we, um, it, the, the, the figures on that particular uh, aspect of society are remarkable. Um, there's, 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 you know, really incredible numbers of, of, of uh, our populations are exposed to domestic violence um, and yet we do virtually no research in it there's just very little done on it at all um, so we um, I, you know we, we've been discussing for a while how we, how we kind of somehow make that research happen um, and uh, I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks um, to be able to announce that we've got uh, an opportunity to, to bring forward a, a really important study looking at uh, brains you know living breathing human beings um but how brains are functioning in midlife um so age 40 to 59 what does uh, uh brain function what does brain structure look like on brain scans uh, in people who've got a history of domestic violence against what we would normally look at in aging so can we begin to see what's happening in that and that, that kind of study i mean it, it's it's such a it's such a such a difficult issue to, to get research off the ground in um, for for reasons which are always difficult to understand but I think this is an opportunity to do something which actually will um, you know be for the first time and we're looking at um, a cohort of something like 180 uh, individuals who've got a history of, of domestic abuse um, about half of them over age 16 half under age 16 um, so we're hoping that we can we can extract some meaningful information from that. So with the with the context of we're looking at sport, but we know we need to move to women in the military, men in the military, domestic violence, all those other topics. But so I, I wanted to put that out there. We also want to make sure that we look at um, different uh, racial backgrounds, the different, you know, does black, brown people suffer in a different way as we're learning in COVID. So look at all those inequities. But given that we haven't done that yet, let's talk about sports now. And we were talking about the three stages and how yeah. you're looking at brain injury with the acronym HOPE in the program. So let's talk about that. Because while I was there, we also went to a conference 
on sports and brain injury. And a lot of stuff happens at these conferences in the bar afterwards. And I saw you make the pitch um, to the to ban heading for children in in uh, I think Scotland and in the UK. So and I know not only are you looking at brains and late light stuff, you're really focused on making sure those practical aspects are given to our children now that first stage. Yeah. So so th this is this is a way that the you know these things take time in evolution, but but we're now thinking about this this problem of uh, head injury and sport and outcomes from head injury and sport and another you know rest of life not just sport but sport is a is a focus at the moment and thinking about uh, that we're, we're thinking about the, the brains of people exposed to brain injury in in kind of three phases of of life effectively so if you can think of it that you've got an early phase in life or a young phase in life where you're engaged in sport, engaged in the activity, you know, receiving the head impacts, receiving the, the injuries. Uh, and, and so you're, you're, you're accumulating injury, accumulating damage in that early phase. Uh, there's then a phase after that where you've, you've left the exposure, so you've left the sport, left the environment where injury is a, is a problem. Uh, and so you're no longer exposed to it, but you haven't developed any late problems like dementia. You, you, your, your brain effectively on the surface, you know, outwardly, nothing's going on, but inwardly, we know the process has begun. So the, the dementia processes have, start, have started. Um, and then many years later, in what we call the late phase, I think of as the late phase is where the dementia syndromes may develop, where the CTE problems may develop. So, so we think of this in three different ways. And that allows us to then address these problems in different ways, because there are different ways to have a conversation about how we deal with young people, there are different ways to have a conversation about how we deal with, with the older group. There are different ways to look at research, there are different ways to look at support, there are different ways to think about how we manage these problems. And when you start to do that, you realize that that early phase, actually the, problem, the solution to that problem is really simple. You know, it's very simple. Get rid of as much head impact exposure as possible and better manage head injuries. So football, soccer in UK has, has tackled that um, head injury, uh, head impact issue, a bit like the US, and they've done away with with heading for youth soccer, reducing um, uh, training um, for adolescents and introducing it slowly, and and now they're beginning to think about the adult phase, you know, the the professional phase, and how can we reduce heading head impacts in professional soccer, and um, so that that would be a, a world's first, but that's a great that's that's translating our research and our, our wish to see things happen into practice. The late phase, um, there's a lot of activity on, you know, trying to understand what dementia in sport looks like, what dementia after brain injury looks like. That's incredibly important because that gives us the clues as to what, what's happening. You know, why, why, why have people with brain injury developed these problems? So that's incredibly important, but unfortunately we have no treatments to offer. There's no, nothing but support we can offer there and recognition. But what we now do, when we do that, we realize this bit in the middle, the midlife bit up until now has been completely virtually neglected you know we've, we've 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 told people injure your brain risk of dementia we're telling people you've got dementia because of brain injury all that population in the middle have been cast adrift with just this fear of dementia and without support so now we're going to work on that group that's the that's the target group and then um one of the things that um i was literally just talking to about hugh williams who will be uh, our guest next week is you know the fear of CTE, the fear of neurological disease, that there is action steps to take, but that the fear itself can create a neurotoxic environment. That's Hugh's words, which I loved, and I wrote down and told him I would use those, but that where, where do we place this fear? And I want to ask personally, you had a youthful sporting career. Uh, you had a uh, bike accident two years ago. So you have a typical history that many of us have. So yeah. personally, where knowing all you know, having the history that you do, how are you approaching the fact that we are moving, we're aging a bit? So, so, so I mean, this this is the whole target in in this research. You know, the the, the way we're looking at it now is thinking about. Uh, people in the in, in in the phase of life I'm in, phase of life you're in, you know, we're we're in that middle bit where we've 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 
done the daft things perhaps, got exposed to injury and continued to do them, I keep falling off my bike and get exposed to more injury. Um, but but I haven't yet developed the problems. But if I if I sat and read just the newspaper headlines, if I sat and worried about the stories that say half of rugby players will develop dementia, um, then then I would begin to get myself in a panic. I would begin to think, you know, when I lost my car keys, when I, you know, couldn't remember to pick up the groceries on the way home, that that you know this was this was a problem. I mean, no mental health issues are not uncommon, particularly these days, you know, with issues around COVID and isolation. Uh, and so, you know, you, I, we, we're worried about, about people sitting, putting two and two together, coming up with five. And there's another way of looking at it. Um, so, so Hughes' phraseology is a good one, but another one is, is this thing called nocebo. So placebo is I, I give you something and it's going to make you better and you feel that drug is affecting. Nocebo is, I, you know, you, you, you get given these continuous negative stories that, that, you know, A leads to B, leads to C, leads to D, and then next thing you know, you've got dementia. And actually that can begin to create problems. So mental health issues then can be, can lead to cognitive issues and then becomes this this issue where it, be, it becomes a, a real concern so this is this is the whole idea in this 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 approach this brain hope as we're calling it which is brain health outcomes in former professional and elite athletes but the important thing was was to squeeze the acronym to make it fit, fit hope because we're trying to get to people and say listen you've played sport yes you've got an injured brain but you know what there are so many things you can do to improve your brain health uh, in the, the next 10, 20, 30 years, which will hopefully change your risk of, of dementia. So don't give up hope. You know, there is always hope. And if you're so stressed out, you, well, I guess you can't go to the pub anymore, but if, you know, yeah. if you spend the next 20 years drinking because of depression and anxiety that you're going to get CTE, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Um, so there was a, there was a, a uh, just 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 the end of last year there was a, there was a Lancet commission on uh, risks for dementia modifiable risk factors for dementia which is probably worth sharing with people, and uh, it basically looks all literature and decided what the the recognised and and evidence based uh, risk factors for dementia were uh, that, that could be modified modifiable risk factors things we can change things we can we can we can intervene with. One of those was traumatic brain injury. And their, their estimate was 3% of dementia is in some way contributed to by traumatic brain injury. There are another 11, another 11 potentially modifiable risk factors that, that we could sit down with former athletes and say, all right, you've had your brain injury, you know, um, there's nothing we can do about that. What about these other 11 things? What are we doing for those? You know, what's your blood pressure? How much are you drinking? What's your mental health look like? What's your diet like? Are you keeping active? Are you connected with people? So, so we can work on all these other things and, and try and give them a positive outlook and say, look, you know, if you can just work with us on all these other things, then we're actually perhaps going to address the balance and, and, and deal with that trauma you've had. I know one of the, the features that, that everybody always brings up is sleep, but I have to say, I mean, and I'm a terrible one with this, you know, um, I not only sleep with my laptop and my phone, um, you know, and I wake up at five o'clock in the morning and I know I should sleep a little longer. Like sleep is unsexy. It's hard to make any money off of it. It's not a hot topic, but it, it, it contributes greatly to our brain health. See, this is, so, I mean, this is, this is the thing. So drug companies have been at, at dementia for many years and it's, it's been a no, no reward environment for them. They put a lot of money in it, but nothing's come back out of it. Um, and, and, and dealing with mid midlife brain health, so dealing with 40, 45 year olds, 50 year olds, and talking about brain health could change the risk of dementia in the 70s. But no drug company is going to hang around for 25 years and find out whether drug X has worked. But to be honest, right now we don't need drug X. We just need good brain health. Um, we just need people to think about it you know, rationally and do the positive things. And I, as I was talking to somebody earlier on today, is that in our soccer study, looking at deaths from uh the gentle brain disease in, in and that's the, i'm sorry that's the field study, field study yeah f-e-l-d field study okay -E -E well, we'll yeah. put the links up afterwards yeah so so in that study we found that former professional soccer players were dying of the gentle brain disease three and a half times higher rate than than people in the, in the population were and that was anything from a doubling of parkinson's to five fold increase in alzheimer's disease and uh in our in our in our approach to say look okay brain injury has happened, but there's these other 11 things we could be working on. We're, our hope is that we may not be able to get our footballers' risk, our soccer players' risk back down to normal population levels. But what we might be able to do is cut it from 
three and a half times down to one and a half times or, or maybe just doubling. If we had a, a drug which could do the same thing, you know, if we had drug X and we were going to give it to 45 year olds and tell them that that would reduce the risk of getting dementia from three and a half times the population number to one and a half times population number, we would be billionaires, you know. Um, mm. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be sitting on Zoom talking to you. I would be flying across my private jet and would be sitting somewhere, you know, sunny and comfortable and talking about this. That's how that's how incredibly important this is. And yet it doesn't cost anything to tell people to, you know, exercise a bit more, concentrate on a diet, deal with the alcohol. So, you know, it's it's that kind of level that we're working with. Um it, gosh, time goes so fast with you. Um, there's so many other areas that I want to talk about. And, I, and I've seen questions. We're already up to 16 questions up on the chat. And I want to give people a chance to talk to you. And if you have a chance to ever meet uh, Dr. Stewart in person, he really is as lovely as he seems on the Zoom screen there. Um, is there anything else? That, uh, that, you, that you would like to sort of sum up or add. Um, if, if we have time, we'd like you to talk about, we, we, in the United States, we're so focused brain injury, CTE, we miss the spectrum of other um, diseases. Um, but I wanted to give you a chance if there's, you know, we've got three or four I mean, minutes. I would probably echo that. I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we've done that thing where we've fallen into the conversation talking about athletes uh, and, uh, and sport that, that, you know, this, the, you know, brain injury, full stop, don't, don't, you know, never mind sports, never mind, you know, um, intimate partner violence, never mind whatever else. Brain injury is a risk factor for dementia. CTE is associated with exposure to brain injury, not to sports brain injury, to repetitive brain injury, to, you know, um, any other circumstance, it's, it's brain injury. So our work, Glasgow Archive, I've looked at the brains of people who've been hit by a car and survive 40 years without any uh, known exposure to brain injury otherwise, and they have pathology of CTE in their brains. We've looked at boxers and they have CTE in their brains. We've looked at rugby players with CTE in their brains. I've only looked at a couple of, of people with domestic violence stories and, and haven't yet seen CTE, but we do see a lot of interest in pathology there. So I think there's a temptation to forget that brain injuries are probably more, in fact, much more common outside of sport than they are in sport, but that sport captures the headlines CTE captures the headlines and it, this, the, the narrative is intended, essentially dominated by sport and CTE, um, but there's a lot more happening out there. Yeah. Um, any, other, any other things before we go? I do wanna first, just, um, I'll, what I thought we'd do is we'd go to uh, questions from people that are live that wanna ask the questions and then I'll read through um, the chat and uh, Car and I will come up with some questions from the chat. Um, any any other things that you'd like to say before we open it up? No, no, no. Let's let's because uh, because okay. I I'll just waffle on rubbish. But let's listen to let's see. No, what no, no, no. Guys. All right. So uh, we have a uh, hundred people. We're we're fully booked, and then um, uh, we will not be answering the Facebook Live questions. But I will go tonight and go through them and put in answers or links if you're coming to us from Facebook Live. So who out there would like to ask a question of Dr. Stewart? Yes, Carmen. Hello, um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask the question to this great researcher. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah, hi Carmen. Uh, okay, great. Um, so I, I studied traumatic uh, brain injury. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here in the United States. And I'm interested in knowing how the hormone levels, like female hormone levels can affect the outcome in the long term of the uh, patients that suffer traumatic brain injury. Have you studied that and how also uh, the fact that they can have like the peel and these things um, can also have an impact in the consequences of traumatic brain injury? Yeah, no, that, that's an excellent question. Um, in terms of long-term outcomes, um, I'm not aware of any strong research in that at all. Um, uh, that, that I've come across, unless you, you've come across anything differently. In terms of the immediate outcomes, so, um, you know, sustaining a concussion, you know, or sustaining a brain injury in the field, and the uh, risk, the immediate symptomology, symptomatology and recovery time, there is uh, some uh, early data, although it's, it's, it's kind of been replicated, that depending where you are on menstrual cycle um, does influence the uh, risk of concussion, the severity of concussion and the, the length of symptoms. Um, and if, if, it, if it occurs in the later phase of cycle, then 
then the 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 symptoms are worse. Um, so I mean that's that's so important. And yet, if you go into the lab and do research on brain injury, I, th I think virtually every every animal that's examined is 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 male. Yeah, no, that's what we we're trying to do. But I was wondering because of the bank, like the brain banks, if there's something that they keep track of in which moment the uh, women were that suffered that was was no, that, if they I mean, register we, this type of information. No, I mean that, that that that's a crazy kind of information that just doesn't get captured, isn't it? I mean, it's just just it, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be so and difficult I'll, to work out. I'll just but, jump in here. The yeah. NCAA, which is the largest study, the care consortium, I actually brought them $150,000 worth of free hormone testing from Abbott to look at the women in that study. And the pushback was there are too many data points. If we have too many data points, it's going to make, we're already looking at, you know, we're already looking at so many other things and they wouldn't add that piece on. And I literally was a little bit like the ex stalking girlfriend. For so, and next time you... I was going to say, do you still have that? Do you still have that available? Because we're, we're going to do a, a study in, in emergency medicine, looking at uh, concussion. Uh, and, and in particular, what we're interested in is, 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 so emergency medicine, if you can, I don't know if, if you know, people have experience of, of having been through the front door is that if you can walk and talk and there's nothing physically too much wrong with you, you get discharged as quickly as possible. Um, and even with a diagnosis of concussion, you get discharged as quickly as possible without any follow up. And what we are concerned with is that we know now that the, the population of the mild TBI who have symptoms some weeks or months down the line is not 10% or 15%. It's actually nearly 50, 60%. Uh, so we're, we're, we're missing people. We're sending people home and giving them no support at all. So what we're doing is a study to capture people in the emergency room and then follow them up a month, you know, see what's happening. Uh, we're 48 hours and then a month. But what we're also going to do is capture uh, a bunch of bloods to them because what we want to do is figure out who is of some index in the emergency room from standard measures that would give us a clue as to who would be the person at risk. So, Catherine, if you still have access to that Abbott offer to test all these samples on us, then we'll, 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 we'll send them your way. And, and the, the issue has never been that it wasn't of, that there wasn't a difference with these male and, male and female hormone cycles. It just, when they, it was seen in the lab, it complicated the results. Sex as a biological variable was seen more as a speed bump to getting clean data. So to clean the data down, to simplify and clean the data, throw out the females. So that's kind of another one of my, you know, 10 year party tricks is going around. And so I love your study where the females. Now, if you're going to study brain injury and you want to have a group of people that are nice and neat and you know, they're going to be there at three o'clock every day, you go to sports. You know, we always talk about, you know, the focus is on sports, but the reason is because you can find brain injury at three o'clock every day on a field. You know, it's a lot harder to sit on a, you know, exit ramp of a freeway waiting for a traffic accident or, you know, so. So, so let, me, let me, let me just, let me just put, yeah. put it, you know, the importance of doing research now. Um, I, there's a study that, that is uh, currently under review in a journal, so I won't tell you too much about it, but we looked at um, soccer um, at uh, male and female um, high school soccer athletes to see what concussion looked like in those groups. And because, it, you know, people have done it, but they haven't really looked closely at, at, at the story behind it. And, and one of the concerns I had was that, that we were kind of assuming that um, female athletes, male athletes were just getting, you know, similar injuries for the same reasons. It's just that women got them more often. Um, and what I wanted to do was figure out, is that true or is there something else? Can, can, can looking at the mechanism of injury, looking at the, the way the injury is handled, give us more information about why uh, the, the, the injuries are different in male and female and perhaps is there something we need to be doing to not just thinking about um, you know the risk is to hire women that's just the way it is is there something different about the way that the women are getting the injury that might tell us something that needs to be different about the sport so I can't tell you the answer to that because it's under review but it turns out that in a sport like soccer for instance we may have to think about slightly different rules for men and for women um, to reduce risk of injury in women that's all I'm going to tell you about it. Ooh, dot, dot, dot. Stay tuned. We'll have you on again. Um, Catherine, you got your hand up for a while. Can you unmute, Catherine? 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, I do want to say that the uh, issue of if you can uh, quickly answer a screening test getting out is uh, very, very strong in the U.S. as well. I had a brain injury and I was able to name 12 animals with one starting with the same letter. But I have a Ph.D. in psychometrics and I really didn't think that that was uh, good enough. <laughs> so a few years later, um, I'd have a very... I'd love to share a study idea using standardized tests because in the US, these SAT and ACT are ubiquitous. And so I'm 50 years old. I should still be able to tell about what percentile would be a good performance. So I'd love to talk to you. But my question to you is, were there any gender differences in the Lancet study on for the risk factors, particularly alcohol? I was wondering if uh, women have any, um, we metabolize differently. So I was wondering no, if that- the, the, No, the, the, uh, I'm just, well, I need to go back because well, this was like, this was basically what they, they were doing was reviewing all available literature and boiling mm -hmm. down. And so nobody's done it. Well, I, I'm sure it's been done, but but the, the Lancet study was just looking at the kind of the this sort of top level. You know, they were they were they were looking at um, what they did was basically sit down, having reviewed all the literature, uh, and apply some science to the, you know, the, the risk factors that were in the risk factors. Yeah, yeah, yeah along those lines. So, so the actual granular detail of each study wasn't included, and they didn't they didn't talk about. Um, I mean, sex was a risk factor for dementia anyway. So, so and it's, it's not modifiable mm -hmm. in in in, this, mm -hmm. in the biological sense. So, ah, I was just wondering if it's more modifiable for men or women at any level. Uh, you know, like if there was an increased benefit at some or decreased benefit for looking at so, something. So, there is women for in terms of just general dementia risk. Uh, if you're a woman, unfortunately, your your risk is higher. Um, and again, reasons for that aren't awfully clear. Um, mm -hmm. but, you know. and, and unfortunately, for the first time since they've been recording history, we're now drinking as much alcohol as men. And that's a lot of that, you know, mom, wine, wine at you know, the wine mommies club and, you know, mm -hmm. wine at birthday parties and me and my girlfriend. And, you know, the, the liquor industry found that they really had hit a wall with how much alcohol that men had drank, but that there was a potential for women. So, um, I think that, uh, and I love how Willie says, you know, in the past, uh, you know, there was more male brain, brain injury than female because men did more daft things, which is your direct quote from you. Um, you know, and if women are drinking more, we're going to do daft things too. So um, my concern is that one of the factors we were, had less on, um, I have a number of people wanting to know the 11, the 11, uh, uh, Risk factors. Yeah. So let, let's and share. Then I'll that, call on Cynthia. I was going to say, why don't we share the the Lancet paper um, at some point after this or link to it? And I, I'll try and remember. This is this is this is kind of a, this is this is my own um, cognitive test, and I can never do it. So tra traumatic brain injury is is number twelve or number one, depending on whose research you're reading. Uh, and then we've got uh, alcohol, diet, um, hearing loss. Uh, Mental health disorder, depression. Uh, what else have we got? Sleep. Hypertension, diabetes, uh, connectivity. So, so social connectivity is another one. And I can't remember. There's three more, but I can't remember what they are. Um, they, they may come springing back to me. But we'll, we'll share that. And I know Cynthia, you've been waiting. A lot. I'm sorry. Is it Cyn Cyn Cynthia? It's Cynthia? It's Cynthia. Hi, Hi. Cynthia. You've been Hi. waiting. Thank you. Uh, thanks. It's easier for some of you on Bo as a nickname because it's shorter and easier, but I didn't, I didn't have it on my screen. Um, I wanted to know for uh, high functioning brains that get injured, um, is the high functioning in general before, does that help you get better anyhow? And uh, because what I'm clear about is there's so little support for a brain injury and, um, and you're not going to stop having the brain that you have but there's so little information about women's brains and how we get better and in older brains. So I'm yeah. wondering if the I mean, list has, has sort of behaviors that could be tracked and a supercomputer could be brought in for keeping the data in estrogen and these different levels that, that uh, Catherine wants to track. I mean, I think, I think, I think that these are, these are great points. I mean, we um, generally, the, in terms of measuring outcomes from brain injury, the science up until now has been uh, you sustain a brain injury and six months or a year later, uh, we call you up and find out how you're functioning. Um, no more detail than that. You know, you're back at work. Um, 
how's your daily activities? Um, it's got a Glasgow outcome score. Um, and that, that's kind of taken as the kind of, you know, a good, a good index of outcome. Um, but but we, we realized in the last decade or so that, that that's not quite good enough because there's a whole bunch of stuff beyond that about, you know, okay, you might be back at work, but, but you know, are you struggling to concentrate? Are you, is your work level dropping off? Is your relationships, you know, falling apart? So there's a whole, whole bunch of other stuff we're not doing properly. And then there's the cognitive issues, you know, the subtleties that aren't immediately apparent um, unless you're really close to somebody. So a lot of research in the last um, decade or so, uh, big studies like track TBI, center TBI, has been looking at, at kind of really detailed outcomes. So, so not just phoning people up at six months and saying, you know, are you back at work yet? How are things at home? But actually bringing them in and sitting down and doing really detailed uh, functional testing um, and seeing how brains are, are working and trying to make some sense of that. Now, they, these studies also have, you know, sent a TBI, I can't remember how many thousand people have, were recruited for brain injury over several years around Europe. But at, at, you know, at the time they presented the hospital with brain injury, a whole bunch of samples were taken, a whole bunch of scans were taken, a whole bunch of assessments were done that will allow us then when we see the data coming in from, from, from people who've gone home and are being assessed at six months and 12 months down the line and we begin to understand what trajectory of brain injury is, to go back to those original samples and samples along the way and say, what, how does somebody get to this point 12 months down the line where somebody else gets to this point? You know, what, what, was, what was the difference at the beginning? So we're only really just beginning to scratch the surface of this. Although I said, you know, the NIH meeting on, on uh, outcomes from brain injury was 50 years ago it's taken 50 years to get to this point and we're only just starting so well my dad would helped create the medical file on things and maybe later i could talk to you about ways we could use seek consumer electronics to help yeah yeah thank you so much um any other questions from the floor There's a lot of questions on um, Catherine, I can share a couple that I see on the side if you'd like. Yeah, is anybody else uh, uh, anybody else anybody else want to ask a question from the floor? Uh, Wendy, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, hi Wendy. Hi there. Uh, that was someone else, but I do have a question. Um, <laughs> okay, let's mine, go. Mine, is, mine is just very short. Um, in general, for men and women, um, one thing I found over here um, is that a lot of people come to us telling us that their physician has told us, and this has gone for men and women that I've seen, uh, that they have CTE. Um, and I know that you can't be diagnosed with CTE um, while you're alive. Um, and we have kind of tried to um, get that in the forefront of people's minds, um, but you know, you've got, and there are cases, right, where people think they have CTE, either they assume it or they've been told that and they killed themselves and it has happened. Um, and of course, those are the cases you hear about the most out of all of them. But I was just curious um, on your side, Dr. Stewart, what do you, do you run into that? And is there anything you would suggest? So far, not yet. So, um, you know, we, I, I, I'm very aware of that. And, and we, we, my, myself and, and 60 odd other colleagues internationally who wrote a letter to the Lancet a couple of years ago expressing real concerns about um, how uh, the reporting particularly of suicide in relation to CTE uh, was, was, was being communicated in certain regions um, because we were very, very worried about that. And actually when you look at the data in, uh, in if you look at the data in um, relation to suicide and CTE confirmed pathology, there's actually fewer um, uh, suicides in patients, former athletes with CTE than, than in athletes who have uh, no CTE uh, autopsy. Um, so, so it seems if you, know, if you were to follow that logic that CTE uh, is a lower risk of, of uh, suicide. And actually in our soccer study, we looked, and this is a, a population where we know they've got high risk of neurodegenerative disease. And we looked then at mental health uh, outcomes, hospitalizations for mental health disorder. And actually our soccer players, despite having three and a half times higher risk of uh, neurodegenerative disease, five times higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, uh, they actually had lower risks of mental health disorder. So up until now, 
the you know we we have, we have not seen this this you know raising of concerns about midlife middle aged um, uh, former athletes or people exposed to brain injury who may have mental health disorder and are, are being told that they have um, CTE. However, uh, we're beginning to see um, the legal actions begin to pick up where uh, lawyers are um, suing sports for uh, alleged mismanagement um, or concerns about management of head injury. And with that comes uh, stories of, of um, youngish men being diagnosed with CTE. Um, and it, it, we, we can't do that yet. We can't diagnose CTE confidently in life at all. Um, and certainly not in young people who um, you know, don't really have the, the fully developed dementia, cognitive issues. So I have concerns, but, but this is, I mean, again, this is the reason why we have this Brain Hope initiative um, taking off um, as quickly as possible, because we want to leap in, get in, educate and support people before um, they get uh, um, less accurate information, perhaps from Google or from uh, media. Um, and just a quick story. In 2011, I pledged my brain for a brain injury study on CT, and I was really locked into my identity being that I was a pre-CTE person. It was my tribe at the time. It felt like a comfortable place to be. I felt like part of something. And then in 2012, I got told I had breast cancer. And I'm like, no, I didn't sign up for that club. They're like, yeah, you have breast cancer. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm neurology, I'm CTE. And they're like, you haven't had a mammogram in two years, you have breast cancer. And, I, and it really had to shift me to, if we don't take care of ourselves in the present moment, all we have is today. If we are so worried about COVID or what else and you step off a curb and a bus runs you over, it doesn't matter what happens tomorrow or next year or next month or in 20, 20 years. So, you know, I've found my tribe now as being neurodiverse between ADD, dyslexia, and a history of brain injury. I'm a neurodiverse person. That's who I am today. And I tick a little differently than other people. And so Clubhouse is a really great app. And just a small ad for Clubhouse. You know, we're building a, a tribe of neurodiverse people. Um, white people, people of color, brown people, indigenous people, and we're building a tribe to see how that works. So I think there's a community to come out of this whose brains work in a different way. And that's, I feel like that's a much more powerful place to be than I pledged my brain and I'm waiting to die so Willie can look at my brain. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, I mean, I always say that, that when people sign up to pledge the brain with me, I, I don't want to see it. I mean, I'm not, it's not like, a, it's not a commitment, you know, you've, you've signed in the dotted line, I expect to see your brain within five years, uh, or, or we'll come and get it. Um, I, 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 I want lots of people to sign up to donate their brains, but I don't want to see their brains. Um, you know, it's, I, I take no pleasure in um, handling uh, uh, people's brains, because that means there's a life lost. Um, but I think it's essential to of course pledge. It is. So of we pledge, yeah. and if you go on um, uh, Pink Concussions, it's a Pink Brain Pledge. And if you're in the UK, Northern Ireland, it'll send you to Dr. Stewart's study. If you're in the US, it'll send you either to the VA study or the Mount Sinai study where you can go if you're in the area and do blood work and MRI, and that's all included. If you're in Canada, it goes to Charles Tater. And hopefully we had to postpone uh, pink concussions in Melbourne, but um, we've contacted the brain bank in Melbourne. So absolutely, everybody on this call, if you're interested enough in this call, you should pledge your brain. So pledge your brain and then go exercise and eat well and sleep and do all those mental health pieces because we're all a little traumatized by COVID. What, what, um, and what, the, the, what we, we have, I, I have, as you, well, you know, you've been in, we, we've got an open door policy, not now because of COVID, <laughs> but, but when COVID leaves us by, we, we have an open door policy. So, so we, we, we welcome people to come in, um, whether it be people who are interested in our research um, or who um, are thinking about brain donation uh, or um, sometimes we, we often have the families of, 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 of brains that have been donated to us come in to, to see what we're doing and, and discuss what we're doing. So, you know, we, we, um, we, like, to, we like to bring people in, let them see what we're doing. Um, we, we obviously have to make sure people have got genuine legitimate interest. We don't just kind of open the door um, and let people wander through. But 
uh, if people want to engage in that way, we, we can. I saw a question just, just to bring back to, there's a question about what's the difference in concussion risk in uh, men and women playing the same sport. Just, just a very quick one on that one is that um, soccer, uh, rugby, sports like that, where the rules are exactly the same, the risk is twice as high in women as it is in men um, for reasons that aren't awfully clear. Um, but there's a lot of work going on to try and figure that one out. So it, we, we know women's concussion twice as high. And we also, there are, the NCAA study is really great because it's looking at these schools where they have equal resources. The women get the same treatment as the men. And they were just, uh, this concussion study this morning, they were saying that they didn't see a difference in delay. Uh, Christine Master from CHOP looked at a study with um, pediatrics and saw that girls were taken to the medical providers, I think five or six days later on average than the boys. So some of the differences we may see may not be biological and sex related, but may be gender of the access we have to resources. Are we, is a, is a 10 year old little girl less likely to take to a doctor than a 10 year old boy? Um, so part, and, part of the study that's under review in soccer in high school, uh, adolescent, um, shows similar things that we're seeing that the, um, I, I'll, I'll discuss this bit because we're among friends. We, we see that the uh, female high school soccer athletes are less likely to have, you know, an athletic trainer on the sideline, less likely to be pulled off in the match, less likely to um, even, you know, come across medical intervention um, that day. Um, whereas the, the boys are, are kind of, you know, seen and dealt with on the pitch and, and pulled off that day. So, so maybe some of the differences um, are because of that immediate acute management. And so, you know, we need one of the messages would be, you know, if you're going to put an athletic trainer in the boys soccer match, you're going to put one in the girls as well. You know, it's the same game, same rules, risk is higher. So, so in fact, if you've only got one athletic trainer, stick them over on the, the girls game, because that's where you're going to see the brain injury, not on the uh, boys game. One of the things that I talk about was with concussions is boys, it's part of their play. It's part of their video games. For years, they are playing video games that include concussion as part of FIFA or soccer, part of their first person shooter games. You know, we don't have a female equivalent of my pretty little pony gets a concussion. So I think it's part of their, their childhood story in a way that may not be for girls. And those are things we can change. And I think that's the point that you were talking about, Dr. Stewart, is with their, their, you know, we don't have a magic drug right now. We don't have a magic treatment, but we have, you know, a, 11 other factors and looking at your three stages, childhood, you know, adulthood, and then late. Oh, there are things at each, each age and each stage that we can do to make a difference. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, th I think we're, you know, we, because the, the, I mean, the, the other way was right. This is purely selfish from my point of view, because if, if we're right that cutting down on head injuries and head impacts will reduce the risk of dementia in athletes, whether they're soccer or football or, or rugby, or whatever, to know if I'm right or not, we're going to have to wait another 30, 40 years. And that's too long because I probably won't be here in 30, 40 years time. So I'm looking for something that will tell me, you know, in the next four or five years, whether I'm right or not, uh, whether you know, working with people's brains, trying to reduce risks will actually make a difference. So if we can't you know, see the acceleration of, of what happens with youth brain injury, what we can do is work in the middle and look at midlife. And there are a bunch of things, that really smart techniques we've got for measuring how our brains are aging in midlife. And so if, if, we, if we looked at your brain today and then looked at it again in three years time, we could see how it's aged over those three years. And the idea would be that we can see how your brain is aging, but get somebody just like you in and do a whole bunch of work on them, get them to cut down the drinking, get them to have a better diet, be more physically active and see whether we can see a difference in brain aging. So that, that's the kind of logic. So it's purely, purely selfish, my point of view. I'm gonna be proven right before I retire or worse. Um, Jen Jennifer had a, qu a quick question and then Wendy would, and then I think we'll have to call it and let uh, Dr. Stewart uh, go to sleep. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Catherine and Dr. Stewart. Um, hi, everybody. Hi. Look, I, I don't know if it affects anyone else this way. I'm, I, be, I was five years out, my five-year five anniversary from all of this horrific um, in IPV is where I got all of this from, was on, was the day after Valentine's Day. And um, the more my symptoms flare, 
the worse it becomes. Uh, and the more I struggle to keep fighting uh, and pushing through and to thrive, I find myself being pushed to research. I try to look everything up that I can. I guess it's to try to make sense of it and to try to still overcome what seems to want to pull someone down because they cannot remove that from their brain, from their memory. I mean, thank God for medication that takes away the nightmares. But recently in the past month or so, I, I mean, I, I've seriously been struggling to find anywhere that I can offer up my story. Not that it's, it's more dramatic than anyone else's, but to be able to be part of a, a, a live study, Dr. Stewart, like you said, just so that I can keep that investigation going and I can't define, I can't make sense of, of really why I feel so motivated to do that. I'm already part of the pink concussions pledge. And uh, um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a veteran. The injuries were IPV related, but but doctor, can you help explain that? And do you see that often? Yeah. So, I mean, th thanks, thanks for for sharing your story and for 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 raising that. I mean, I I I, I mean, I, I'm guessing that that from your accent and where we're talking, that, that you're not going to be in the UK or Ireland for us to be able to work with you directly. No, darn it! I would no. like to say but, I would. But, but I tell you, I tell you what the plan is: that that we a bit like you know we're we're, we're dealing with the sport. What, what 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 we're hoping to do is is work with our population who have the stories of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and to you know at the moment we've, we've just done a screening we just we just know that we've got them um to, to study in this 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 um this this population we're working with and i think what 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 hasn't been done is a very good history is exactly what the exposures were and and how it's affected them and all and, and all these other things so so we're now i've got a phd i'll tell you this much because it, it, it's, it's almost out anyway we've got a phd who's starting in another month who's going to do this with me and that's a good way to get things going. Somebody young, keen, enthusiastic who can actually roll the sleeves up and get in about it. And so she's going to commit her time to doing this and finding out uh, exactly what what is the stories are. You know what's happening, and we we will be able to follow these 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 participants along, these these research uh, colleagues along, for the next three years, five years, ten years. The idea is we're going to continue the study as long as we can keep the research alive. And see what's happening. You know, what, what, what's what's the trajectory? What's the outcome? Again, the whole point is is to try and figure out if we can work out what's going on in people who have an experience like this. Then, then there's a, there's a chance we can actually do something to try and address that, and chance we can try and do something to to treat it specifically. The eleven things we're talking about to modify risk of dementia apply to everybody, but there may be very specifics. That we need to be applying to just individuals with your kind of story is there one thing in particular we're working on so that's what we're aiming for and again I, i'm i'm kind of I, i've got a really you know my attention span is really short so if 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 i set up a study that's going to take 10 years to deliver that's too long i need to i need to figure out what's happening in the next few years to make a difference um and is that is that a position funded yet is that have you I'm been not, able to can't quite tell you that. Uh, that's 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 the top secret part. It's uh, it's. Okay, it's, I wanted to do a pitch for funding if that was something that was needed. So. Well, I I I am I, um, I'm got a very very exciting collaboration um, potentially on funding. Uh, but so you'll have to come come back when you can tell us. Soon as soon as, soon as I know, I'll let you know. But but we've got to um, we we just need to sign some uh, sign some paperwork. I've just seen actually. Can I just call somebody out? Because I've just seen scrolling along the top, Emma Russell. And I want to know if that's Emma from my lab. And if it is Emma from my lab, do you want to come on and say hello? Has she gone? Text her. Text her to come I back text, on. I did. I, I tried to text her, but where'd she go? She just scrolled um, by. Uh, okay. She she may she may have escaped just in time. Okay. Oh, uh, we, we we always Emma's come. Emma's the brains. But, oh, there's no. She's still there. Emma. 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 Um, Dr. Stewart has an, when I was there, was an all-female lab. Do you know how cool it is to walk into a laboratory and see 
all the positions be female. It, it's just so inspiring and such brilliant women. So they are, um, and, and you know, they, 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 we, we, have, we have a policy. We just we just recruit the best people um, and interview, you know, four or five people for every post, and the, the best person gets the job, and the best person for all the jobs up to that point where we're female. Although we do have, you, you wouldn't meet Craig. Um, Craig, Craig is Craig is our bloke. We've got we've got a man in the lab. Oh, you have a bloke now. <laughs> we've got a man in the lab, um, and uh, and Craig, but, but, but uh, yeah, yeah, Craig, Craig is just in the office with all the women, and, and poor Craig, I feel sorry for him. Nick, did you raise your hand there? I don't know. It's Nick. Uh, <laughs> Nick can say hi, and I'm sorry, Wendy. We'll do Nick then, Wendy. I was like dragging Nick in because Nick's Nick's in Australia, so he uh, he gets up early to to well done, for our weekly yeah. chat. No, I, I I do have a question for for Willie. Um, look, I was just wondering. One of the biggest challenges I have in Australia is getting dementia researchers to include histories of domestic and family violence in any kind of, and there are a number of them, prospective cohort studies. And I'm just I, and I've, I'm just casting around wildly for dementia researchers who are interested in histories of domestic and family violence. Um, well, that's us, and, yeah. So, so how, how I managed to unlock this problem is because I, I'm interested in brain injury and dementia. And, and to do brain injury and dementia studies properly, what you need is, is a study of, of dementia or aging brains in people who haven't had brain injuries. So to understand the pathology of trauma you need to understand normal aging that's the whole point because you know how do we know that somebody who's been hit by a bus whose brain is changing isn't just aging normally so i i was i was kind of you know scribbling plans down for research for for years um and wandering around meetings lonely looking for somebody who could who could who I could work with and i happened to be at a meeting in edinburgh and a colleague in edinburgh presented his research on dementia where he was looking at midlife individuals, 40 to 59, where the idea was to, to gather up as much information about their life as possible, gather up as much about their brain function as possible, scan the brains, take all the blood samples. Um, and I, said, I suddenly thought, well, that's brilliant. There, there's a study, somebody in dementia who's doing just what I need in normal aging. And now can I, can I put into that study some people with, with a, a story of brain injury and, and, and work together to actually unlock brain injury? Now, what subsequently I, I went back to him and said, like, I don't suppose um, in your study of, of 700 now um, normal middle-aged, midlife aging, I don't suppose um, you have enough information on brain injury and exposure to brain injury for me to be able to see what's happening in women and, and, and perhaps talk about uh, domestic violence. And he said, well, fine enough. Um, we do have information on that is one of the questions we asked. So, so he sensibly had thought about this because he'd thought about all the potential risk factors and how to factor them in and so that's how we can unlock this study now because embedded within this this big group of 700 there's a a, a cohort um who have uh, exposure to to this kind of, of of injury that we can we can begin to work with now what he's got is top level data you know history of domestic abuse yes or no there's not much information there but what we can now do is go back with my phd and sit down with, the, with everybody involved and ask them much more detailed questions, get much more information about injury, you know, exposures, what exactly happened. And of course, it's not all brain injury, there are other things that go on as well. So we need to understand that too. So um, I, think, I think it's just fortunate, it's having the right people in the right place. This was literally just sitting at a conference. And as I was idly dealing with emails, as you do, and, you know, scribbling down notes, my ears pricked up when I heard Craig speak and I thought that guy's doing exactly what I want and, and I need to go and speak to him. So three years later, here we are. Oh, that's, that's absolutely fabulous. Um, and I just wanna, I know when, Wendy, I'm sorry, I, I said that you could speak. Oh, that's okay. You. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Uh, I was just gonna make a very quick comment, um, a, a very good book on just general brain health, um, not having to do anything with um, traumatic brain injury, Probably a lot of people know about this. Um, the Nun Study of Aging and Alzheimer's Disease yeah. is just a fantastic um, uh, analysis of the brains um, in relation to, you know, the influence of diet and other environmental factors, education, and even looking at writing samples. It's a super easy read, and it's really fascinating. Anyway, probably a lot of people know about that, but uh, thank you. 
Thank you. No, I mean, it's, that's, that's a fascinating study, and I still go back to, there's a lot of really interesting papers that have come out of that that have told us an awful lot about um, what we need to be doing. Thanks. Well, I have uh, extended a few minutes beyond. I, I do want to thank you, Dr. Stewart. Next week, we have Hugh Williams on, and we're going to talk about uh, the justice system and brain injury in women in prisons, uh, brain injury in women and uh, brain injury in adolescents, and what you know, what is the what is the percentage of our population that are incarcerated right now that do have brain injury, and how can we do something about that rather than locking people up with brain injury? Um, so that will be our topic next week with you. I want to thank you, Dr. Stewart. Do you want to say one of a, a, a closing statement of any kind of any length? I just, uh, just, uh, just a quick thing. Thank you uh, for for inviting me on. I really enjoyed the conversation. I enjoyed the the questions afterwards. And again, we 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 like to try and reach out to people and engage people as much as possible. So if anybody's got any questions or follow up, um, then they can you know, can find me on on websites and and uh, dial into me. And a suggestion for a future conversation is to bring in young people because I'm certain that Emma is Emma from my lab. So. Why don't why, why don't we we set up one in the future with with the the PhDs to figure out what got them into it and what the plans are, and then Emma can can reveal herself. Absolutely, and if if anybody in the audience has um, we're I mean originally we were we were kind of locked into the twenty people here, but the show's been so popular we were over a hundred for pretty much the entire show today. So we're getting about fifteen hundred views on uh, Facebook Live and then a couple hundred every week on uh, on YouTube. So this will be available if my son edits it tonight um, and he wants dinner. Um, it should be on <laughs> later on tonight. Um, when you're trapped with your mom during COVID, you end up editing her videos. Um, really appreciate your time. I know it's late there in the UK. Um, you have always inspired me and have always opened your doors to any of the projects I wanted. So I wanna thank you for that. And um, yeah, just uh, everybody stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. And we'll see you next week on Casual Conversations.